Well, open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, So if you haven't been here the last few weeks, or if this is your first time here, uh, we've been, as a congregation, working our way uh, through the Lord's Prayer. And this morning we're thinking about the line in the Lord's Prayer where it says, uh, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Uh, We'll read the whole of verses 9 through 15. So this is the Lord Jesus speaking. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now we're going to read the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 51, which is really... Uh, a guide to how Christians have typically understood uh, this petition. Uh, So what does the fifth request mean? Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, means because of Christ's blood, do not hold against us, poor sinners that we are, any of the sins we do, or the evil that constantly clings to us. Forgive us just as we are fully determined, as evidence of your grace in us, to forgive our neighbours. Will you pray with me now? Well, Lord, we know that you do powerful things through your word. Uh, Lord, you spoke and creation came into being. Uh, You speak and lives are transformed. Uh, You speak and all things do your bidding. And so, Father, we trust that these words that we've just read from your word are powerful words and true words and necessary words. And, Lord, we pray for each and every one of us. You see us as we are. Lord, would you draw near to us by your word, through your spirit. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the whole uh, idea and reality of forgiveness is huge in our lives, isn't it? Uh, The exposure to hurt, and therefore the need to either extend or withhold forgiveness, is just as unavoidable as the need to breathe or to drink water. Uh, You don't need to live long in any human relationship before you get hurt, uh, either deliberately or accidentally. If you have close friends in your life, there will be a need for forgiveness. If you're part of a family, there'll be need for forgiveness. If you're married, if you're in a workplace, if you're working closely alongside other people in any context, uh, then this is utterly unavoidable. And often forgiveness or the lack of forgiveness tends to be the hinge on which relationships turn. Our forgiveness can transform a hurtful period into actually a growth of trust and intimacy and friendship. Or a lack of forgiveness <clears throat> can blow up like a balloon until it's all that you see and it begins to consume you. So forgiveness is huge. It's something every one of us faces. But not only forgiveness on kind of a societal or relational level, but just as much forgiveness with God is huge. If you're not a Christian, 
here this morning, we're delighted that you're here, then actually your need for God's forgiveness is the most pressing need in your life. Uh, Because you've rebelled from God, you've snubbed the very God who made you, and you need his forgiveness desperately. But actually, even if you are a Christian this morning, uh, the issue of God's forgiveness is still incredibly pivotal. You can still often find yourself wondering, has God really forgiven me? What if he hasn't? Is he still willing to forgive me, even when I've fallen into that same sin again? Is it possible that I've outsinned his forgiveness? So forgiveness matters. Forgiveness with God and forgiveness with each other uh, touches each one of our lives in profound ways. There's not one of us here this morning who can say, I don't need to hear this. This doesn't apply to me. No, we all need to hear what the Lord has to say here. So what does God teach us in this verse about forgiveness? What does the Lord call us to? Well, the first thing we see is that we are called because of Christ to confidently seek God's forgiveness. So while the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer was all about our physical need for daily bread, uh, the fifth petition is all about our spiritual need uh, for the forgiveness of sin. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now notice the word that Jesus chooses to utilize. Uh, Forgive us our debts. Now, of course, Matthew and Luke, the two places in the New Testament that have the Lord's Prayer, uh, there are three different words that are used in relation to this petition. Uh, Debt, sin, and trespasses. And they're all uh, largely similar, but each has its own particular nuance to it. And the particular nuance to debt is something owed that must be paid, a liability to punishment. And so Jesus is teaching us through his word here uh, that we are to think of our sins in that manner, that we are to think of our own sins as something owed to God, a punishment merited, that actually through our sins we've racked up a debt we could never pay, a mountain of debt that would have crushed us and that only grows day by day. Every sin committed in your life, every good deed in which self is mingled in, every prayer prayed in which the love and esteem of God is not foremost, every act of love that we should have done but didn't do, every harsh word we've uttered, every thought or deed driven by unbelief. Now you might think of somebody uh, perhaps getting into trouble with credit cards. Uh, This person started off fairly reasonable, and he just used his credit card to pay off the outstanding bills. But then he set off down the slippery slope, and he begins to use his credit card to buy more and more things that he doesn't actually need. Huge TV, brand new car, a decadent holiday. And before he knows it, uh, he's up to his neck in debt. The creditors are prowling. Interest is rising. He's having to get additional credit cards just to pay off the interests of the other credit cards. He's up to his neck in debt. And really, he's too far in now to pull back. He simply can't remedy the situation. Every attempt to get himself out only digs the pit a little bit deeper. And outside of Christ, that's where we stand before God. We stand up to our neck in debt that we couldn't pay, condemned, Guilty, hopeless. 
but Jesus. You see, if you want the gospel really as condensed as it could possibly be, but Jesus, that you were condemned with a debt you couldn't pay, but Jesus came and paid that debt. You couldn't save yourself, but Jesus, God in the flesh, said to the Father, our Lord, credit it to my account. I will pay it. Let the consequences fall on me. But Jesus. And it's wonderful news. So far, so good. But there's a little bit of a problem. And the problem is, well, then why do we even need to pray? Forgive us our debts if actually our debts have already been forgiven in Jesus? Why do we even need to pray, pray this petition if actually we're already debt-free through the gospel? I mean, isn't that one of the pillars of the gospel? That actually we've been justified, we've been set free from our sins through faith alone in Christ alone. Our sins have been forgiven. Our sins have been punished in Christ. So why do we still need to pray this? I mean, in a sense, it feels redundant. And maybe like asking my wife Amy, will you marry me when you're already married? So why do we need to pray this? Well, one of the best answers I've been able to find is from an old Scottish pastor by the name of Thomas Boston. And this is what he wrote. I've got it up here so that you can see it. He said, there is a twofold pardon of sins. The one is the removal of eternal wrath and is called legal pardon. The other is the removal of fatherly anger and is called gospel pardon. We can also see it in one of the confessions we hold, the Westminster Confession of Faith, where it says much the same thing. It says God does continue to forgive those that are justified. And although they can never fall from the state of justification, yet they may, by their sins, fall under God's fatherly displeasure and not have the light of his countenance restored to them until they humble themselves, confess their sins, beg pardon, and renew their faith and repentance. And really to kind of bring that to what it means for us, it's really the difference between approaching God as judge and as father. Uh, when we become Christians, uh, if we are Christians here this morning, then we become God, come before God as judge. And we cast ourselves on his mercy, trusting in faith alone and Christ alone. And God acquitted us of all of our sins, past, present, future. Our debt was entirely done away with, end of story. Our sins can't come back like ghosts to haunt us. No, Jesus cried, it is finished, and it is. But that's not actually what this petition is about. Rather, this petition is not so much about approaching God as judge, but instead approaching God as father. You see, our sins can never bring God's judgment or God's justice upon us anymore. But they can still cause God fatherly displeasure. And they can still interrupt and disrupt our relationship and life with him. You see, the sins of the Christian are not sins against law, but sins against love. And so we pray, forgive us our debts. You see, we as Christians, we love God. And so actually we're deeply grieved that we sin against him, even if those sins are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus. We grieve that actually our life with him is interrupted and are harmed by our sin. And so we confess our sins knowing his love, knowing the fact that actually our sins have already been paid for in Christ knowing that God delights to extend his fatherly forgiveness to his children uh, day after day. 
You see, the, this petition before us isn't the cry of the accused before the judge. No, it's the cry of the child before their loving father. And so this forgiveness, this gospel pardon, as Boston put it, is a daily occurrence. Right? It's why we confess our sins as a church week by week. It's why we're called to confess our sins as Christians day by day. Every sin a Christian commits is a forgiven sin, a covered sin. And yet every sin causes God fatherly displeasure. And every sin interrupts and hinders our life with him. And so we pray, Father, forgive us our debts, knowing that he will, for the price has already been paid. But Jesus doesn't stop there, does he? He could. He could just read, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, lead us not into temptation. But it doesn't. Instead it says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And so the second thing we learn in this verse is because of Christ willingly forgive others. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So why does Jesus add this? Why does he include it? Why does he jump straight back to it after the Lord's Prayer in verses 14 and 15? I mean, both verse 12 and verses 14 to 15 seem to read as conditional. Uh, Forgive us to the extent that we have forgiven others. It seems to really give a condition to God's forgiveness. Now, there's a couple of ways we could read this. Uh, We could read it that actually God's forgiveness of us is conditional. That to be forgiven is conditional upon forgiving others. Kind of a reciprocal quid pro quo relationship. We do our part and God will do his. That by our forgiveness of others, we show that we're worthy. We earn God's forgiveness of us. But actually, that cuts straight across the gospel, doesn't it? That cuts straight across grace, straight across the sheer weight of our sins. That collapses the gospel of grace and leaves us with a gospel of works, which the New Testament repudiates time and time again. So it can't mean that. The other and more likely way we could read it is that actually our forgiveness or lack of forgiveness towards others is a major indicator of whether we have in fact tasted grace ourselves. That your willingness to extend or withhold forgiveness is a major indicator of whether you have in fact tasted God's forgiveness in your own life. That put incredibly bluntly, forgiven people forgive. And that at the very least, persevering unforgiveness in a professing Christian casts grave doubt on whether that person is a true Christian. I mean, Jesus seems to put it that bluntly. If you look down at verse 15, he says, If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will the Lord forgive you your trespasses. You can see the same in Mark 11, 25. That really, in Jesus' eyes, an unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron, a paradox like a hot day that's cold or a wet water that's dry. That actually, if you're unwilling to forgive your brother or your sister, then you're on extremely shaky ground in expecting that God has forgiven you. That unforgiveness is a particularly potent sign of unforgiven. I mean, that seems to be the point of Jesus' parable that Carl read for us earlier. Now, like Carl mentioned, a talent of gold was worth about 20 years' wages for a laborer. So 10,000 talents uh, would have taken around 200,000 years for the average laborer to pay off. Huge sum of money. 
if we put the yearly rate at a fairly low $50,000, then this would have been an a overall debt of about $10 billion. Huge amounts of money. And that same slave was owed by the other slave 100 denarii. Now, a denarii was about a day's wage for a labourer. So if we put a day's la wage at, say, $150, then this is about 15,000. The servant of the king had been forgiven $10 billion, and yet he couldn't let go of 15,000. You see, that's why when you read that parable, you're supposed to be left with really a sense of this righteous indig indignation. That hypocrite, how dare he hold this small amount against his fellow slave when he has been forgiven an unpayable sum. How dare we refuse to forgive others when we have been forgiven of a debt that would have rightly landed us in hell? Right, that's the logic here. That if you're a Christian, you've been forgiven an incalculable sum that actually you were on the way to everlasting torment, and God forgave you willingly at the cost of his own son. So how could we ever refuse to forgive another, regardless of how deeply they may have hurt us? Right, their debt against you is nothing compared to the debt you had before God, and yet God freely forgave you. You see, there's something particularly heinous and ugly and hypocritical about unforgiveness in a professing Christian. And so beware of the sin of unforgiveness. If it's in your life this morning, then actually you must repent of it. You must. And it can be incredibly hard. Right? Even as Christians and new creatures in Christ... It can be incredibly hard to forgive, especially those that have hurt us in the deepest ways. Maybe parents that have left us permanently scarred. Friends that have betrayed our trust. Spouses that have been unfaithful or let us down in ways that we wonder if we will ever get over. People who have abused us. And forgiveness doesn't mean that we pretend it never happened. It doesn't mean that there are no consequences for the guilty party or no consequences or further interventions that may need to happen. And it equally doesn't mean that you may not still feel hurt by them. Forgiveness is not first an emotion or a feeling, but rather it's an act of the will are to be reconciled, to no longer hold it against them, to let it go because Christ has let your debt go. You see, Christian forgiveness is always rooted in the gospel and what Christ has done for you. In Colossians 3 and verse 13, it says, As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. I'm sure many of you know the name Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth's first marriage was to a man by the name of Jim Elliot, who along with four other men in their 20s were missionaries seeking to reach the Orca tribe in Ecuador, a hostile tribe that were known for their savagery, and they were seeking to reach them with the gospel. And so they tried and tried to get into contact with this hostile tribe. And they finally got into contact uh, only for all five of them to be spared to death. Uh, at the time that Elizabeth heard it, uh, her husband was only 28 years old. She had a 10-month-old child. Uh, her whole world shattered in a moment. And humanly speaking, uh, she had every reason to harbour bitterness and hatred to let unforgiveness towards this hostile tribe 
just smolder within her heart. But instead she forgave. Now this tribe who had killed her own husband, destroyed her family, and not only forgave them, but actually went to live with them, that she might continue the work of the gospel in that tribe. She later wrote this. He said, to forgive is to die. It is to give up one's right to self, which is precisely what Jesus requires of anyone who wants to be his disciple. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And so especially if there is even anyone here this morning who is holding on to unforgiveness, beware. It's a poison that's slowly killing you. And it's a weed that will only grow larger with time. Maybe it is too much for you. But if you're a Christian, then you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And it is not too much for him. Forgiven people forgive. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for the simple old gospel. We thank you, Father, for truths that we have heard hundreds, if not thousands of times. That, Lord, we had a debt before you, a debt that was terrifying, Lord, and just how astronomically huge it was. And, Father, you knew that we could not pay that debt. That, Lord, any efforts we tried would only dig ourselves further in. And yet, Lord, you chose us in love. And you sent your own son that he might pay the price for us. And, Lord, we openly acknowledge that we don't really understand that, Lord. That we don't really get just how huge that act of grace was. And yet we thank you for it with all of our hearts. And Lord, as your forgiven people, we pray that we too might be a people of forgiveness. Lord, you know we love to hold on to hurts. Now that we don't want to let it go. But Father, we pray that just as you have forgiven us everything, that we would freely and we willingly forgive others in our own lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.